I would like to kick this conversation off as quickly as possible. There are just two things I would like to mention at the beginning. So one is we have a dedicated session for your questions. So please use the opportunity later on to ask our expert and star professor from Harvard everything that you would wish to know about gender equality. And secondly, um, we'll have a book sale from her book, What Works Afterwards. There are only 100 copies, unfortunately, but please bring your cash, 33 Swiss franc, and um, you can also get a signature from Professor Bonet. So, as Professor Guzzella mentioned, my background is mechanical engineering, and when I went for my first lecture, I was one of the very few women. But I believe many more women could study technical sciences, and that we actually should do that as well. So when I read your book one year ago, I was very happy and relieved that finally there were some scientific evidence what actually works and what does not work. For those here in the audience who have not had the chance to read your book yet, can you tell us in a nutshell what is your book about and what was the intention with, with, with which you wrote the book? So first of all, thank you very much for um, having me here. It's um, a great pleasure to uh, spend the next hour with all of you. And it is indeed a beautiful sight uh, to see so many of you uh, in this room. Uh, I, um, I, I, in fact, graduated from the institution next door from the University of Zurich. And, um, but I have been spending now about 20 years uh, at Harvard. So the reason I wanted to write the book was that I felt that um, we were in need of bringing more rigor and more evidence to the question of diversity more generally, inclusion more generally, but also in particular to the question of gender equality. So the title, What Works, is really what I mean in that most of the evidence, and that's what we'll, we'll be very familiar with the people in, this, in the audience here, most of the evidence is actually based on clinical trials, only that we in economics don't call them clinical trials, we call them randomized controlled trials where we also have a treatment group and a control group and kind of measure the way you, know, you all in the natural sciences measure whether something works, whether something has an impact. Um, and that's the evidence that I discuss in the book um, when we you know, test diversity training or when we test a certain interview practice. Does it actually work? Uh, does it affect who we hire? Does it affect the quality of the people we hire? the quality of the people we promote, the quality of the people who are in our organization. So that's the what works part. And then uh, it is the subtitle of gender equality by design. Um, I mean, gender equality, I think, uh, is self-explanatory. Um, by design is actually great timing on our part because some of you are probably aware that uh, on Monday, the Nobel Prize in economics was awarded to Richard Thaler, who was one of the founding fathers of behavioral economics. And that's, of course, my discipline, and that's what I um, apply in the book. Um, so I felt that I had maybe two things to contribute. One was to base uh, our intuitions or our practices a bit more on evidence, on the real data. And the second contribution uh, was that I thought my discipline, my particular discipline in behavioral economics, had something to contribute. Yeah, and we appreciate that you base everything on evidence because there, is so, there are so many emotions in this discussion that we are actually very grateful that we go back to the basics and say this is what actually works and this is what does not work. So Sharon Sandberg, the COO of Facebook and one of the evangelists for more diversity, mentioned at last year's World Economic Forum that we have only less than 10% of top management globally that is run by women and we have less than 8% of female head of states. Now, a few days ago, um, her organization Lean In and McKinsey um, published a study on gender equality and say that actually, despite that discrepancies, 50% of men are okay with that, and 30% of women are okay with that situation as well. Based that so many people are okay with it, um, what's the problem with letting men continue to run the world? Why do we need diversity? <laughs> um, so I, I always have two answers to that question, and I, I, I do think it is important to give the first answer first. 
and that is that um, equality actually is a human right. So gender equality actually is a human right. Um, now, clearly, I am also am uh, on the board of uh, Credit Suisse, and there are probably other uh, private sector representatives in the room, so I also understand that the business case is important. Uh, but we have to start with the human rights case in that discrimination is just not um, something that most countries or most companies find acceptable. So there is um, some action that we have to take. Um, but, you know, your question, of course, uh, also asks whether there's more than the human rights case. Is there actually a business argument uh, to have diversity in the room? And uh, the evidence is very, very strong uh, if we look at teams. So now we can measure the intelligence of teams, the way we measure people's intelligence. It's called collective intelligence. Um, and it turns out that diverse teams do outperform homogenous teams. Now it gets more difficult to establish causality when we look at diversity at the top of companies. Uh, because we can't you know, randomly create these um, heads of state or heads of companies. So, we can look at correlations between uh, people at the top and company performance, but we can't really know whether it is these people who actually make the difference, or maybe it's just amazing companies who select more um, diverse boards or more, select senior, uh, more diverse senior management. But in any case, um, Credit Suisse and a number of other organizations have actually studied this question. So Credit Suisse has a very nice um, a number of very very good reports uh, looking at uh, the 2,500 uh, to 3,000 biggest companies in the world, just asking the question, is there a correlation between the diversity on the corporate boards and company performance? Um, and the answer to that is uh, yes, there is a correlation. Now again, as I said, we have to be careful. This could be because these diverse um, boards uh, make actually a difference, diverse senior management makes a difference, but it could also be that other things are happening in the company and that they are just also more inclusive. Mm -hmm. So when we go about the root causes for the gender imbalance that we have right now, you quote in your book um, Nobel laureate Eric Kandel, who found out that 80 to 90 percent of all our decisions are made unconsciously. So how do unconscious biases affect this gender imbalance? Yeah. So clearly, there's lots of reasons for uh, gender inequality, and unconscious bias is only one of them. But the book in particular focuses on unconscious biases, arguing that uh, there are often good people, like everyone in this room, making bad choices. So my book is for all of us who kind of want to do the right thing and kind of don't want to discriminate, uh, but then don't get around to doing it. That's very behavioral economics because um, in behavioral science, we often argue that there is this intention action gap, whether this is in terms of diversity or in terms of you know, eating the chocolate bar or the apple. Well, the intention is to eat the apple, but then we kind of don't get around to it and we eat the chocolate bar. Or we plan to you know, exercise in the gym, but we then kind of you know, go, f um, go and have a beer with our friends and can do other things. So there's lots of intention action gaps in the world, actually. Um, and you know, we, as behavioral scientists, kind of try to build a bridge from our intentions, from our virtuous intentions, to actual behaviors. And so that's, um, I mean, Eric Kandel, of course, uh, she's not alone, kind of arguing that so many of our judgments are made um, subconsciously without our awareness. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I am trying to build this bridge for all of us to actually get around to doing something. So when you go back to the subconscious decisions that we actually make, there was one example in your book that struck me. Um, it was an example that illustrated these biases. And um, so I'll tell you that story quickly. So it's a dad and a son sitting in the car, getting into a car accident. The father passes away, and the son survives and is brought to the hospital. So in the emergency room, the surgeon starts crying and says, I can't do the surgery because it's my son. So raise your hand if you're confused right now. <laughs> OK, maybe not that biased. Um, so yeah, many of us think um, how can that be? Because somehow we automatically expect that that would be a man, but the surgeon can also be a mother. So mm -hmm. then it makes perfect sense again. Um, 
So biases exist. They're everywhere, and they also have good, good things. Um, now, companies invest over 8 billion US dollars per year in diversity trainings to kind of de-bias our minds. With over 8 billion US dollars invested in those trainings on a yearly basis, um, and um, the World Economic Forum actually ha has this gender gap calculator that says it's still taking 83 years until we have complete gender equality. But think about that. It took 40 years to put a man on the moon. Um, so with so much investments into diversity trainings, um, why haven't we reached gender equality yet? Yeah. So the 8 billion um, are just for the US. Um, and that's probably an understatement. Um, although I do understand that uh, diversity training is less popular in you know, German-speaking countries, I mean, including our country here in Switzerland. Um, but it is very popular in the US, and it has been the preferred instrument for the last 50 years. Um, really, it started with the, maybe 60 years, it start, started with the civil rights movement. And many, many companies have um, engaged in diversity training. Now, I think the skeptics uh, in the room might think, well, this wasn't meant seriously anyway, and was just checking the box, right? It's just kind of compliance, kind of check the box and we're done. Um, and that's certainly true for some companies. But even for companies and organizations which took it quite seriously and in fact wanted to make a difference, wanted to help our minds to perform better, um, even those companies haven't had a lot of success. And that's kind of the big question, right? Why is it not working even when we're trying hard? Um, and don't just do you know, a one hour online training and you know, then we check the box and we're done with it. And the answer kind of is that our minds are pretty stubborn beasts. And it is actually hard to change mindsets. It's really, really hard to change mindsets. Um, and I think it's just the wrong instrument. So it is um, money down the drain, um, at least eight billion a year in the US. And we should just stop doing that. And in, instead um, of focusing on our minds, we need to de-bias our systems. Very nice. So we can feel relieved. It's not about that we need to change ourselves because we can't, but we need to change the system. Well, um, so I don't want to let us off the hook completely here. <laughs> um, uh, so of course I'm hoping, and not just I'm hoping, um, but the evidence suggests that often our beliefs follow our behaviors. So eventually, I'm actually quite hopeful that our beliefs will change. And um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Um, it's much later in, our book, in my book, but we're, I think we're not quite going chronologically anyway, so that's just fine. But there's really good evidence um, from India. India was one of the first countries in the world to introduce quotas. Um, now, quotas aren't a behavioral instrument, but they're interesting in that they change who we see very quickly. So they change the surgeons, so to speak, right? They introduced quotas for um, mayors. Uh, and in fact, a third of all village heads were selected out of a hat at random. And so that was interesting from a research perspective because then we could actually establish causality and could follow this natural experiment over many years. And some colleagues of mine, um, Esther Duflo at MIT and Rohini Pandey actually at, at Harvard, um, kind of followed this um, for many years and were asking the question, you know, do these women, A, make a difference? But more importantly for your question right now is, do these women affect what we think is possible? But eventually, seeing is believing and if we see more women in these counter-stereotypical positions, in these leadership positions, maybe our minds and our beliefs will follow. And that's exactly what they found. Uh, it wasn't a recent science paper, by the way, for those of you who are interested in it. Um, and it's not the first woman. So sadly enough, it doesn't take just one. But in villages which had been um, exposed to at least two female mayors in those about 24 years now, mindsets were starting to change and people started to believe that political leadership could be about women, leading parents um, to believe that a core career aspiration for their daughters should be to become politicians. Now that's of course you know, irrational, you will say, there's not millions of jobs in politics, but we're of course exploiting here another bias, it's called the availability bias, in that sometimes available information, whether that's in the media or whether that's what you remember, something that's particularly salient, um, comes to mind, sometimes is taken um, uh, 
to also mean probabilities. So available information is taken to be also likely information. And that's actually what, exactly what we're seeing in India. So that's why I wanted to say I'm not actually giving up on humanity completely. Um, but I, I am arguing that uh, we should start by making it easier for our minds to get it right. And then our behaviors and our minds will follow. Yep. So it is something that we ha absolutely have to do. Once we see those role models, our, our minds will adjust. It's just something that will not happen right now. You mentioned that it takes two generations of women. And then we kind of will see some effects. So when we go back to what can we actually do now, um, how about we all lean in? We all start negotiating our salaries. We ask for promotions. We speak up more. Does yeah, um, so that's uh, not a bad idea, <laughs> generally. Um, but uh, we, we, we have to be um, quite cognizant of the evidence that leaning in, in fact, can be quite risky in particular for the counter-stereotypical people, for the women among us. Let me explain that a little more. In fact, I want to um, share with you another kind of little story. It's a bit like the surgeon story, but it is a story that we now use in many, many business schools around the world to teach our students about the power of unconscious bias in the moment. So this is a case study. Those of you who study in business administration will be familiar with these case studies. A case study about a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and her name is Heidi Rosen, as a real person, and her real name is Heidi Rosen, very successful venture capitalist, she's also an entrepreneur, um, and that case study um, describes how she built her enterprises, and she networked and did many wonderful things. Um, we're now taking this case study and give half of our students the case study with the protagonist being called Heidi, and then the other half of our students with the protagonist being called Howard. And so then you read the case study. It's completely identical, but for the names of the protagonists. You prepare for class. You also fill out a survey before you come to class where we ask you questions such as, how successful do you think Heidi and Howard were? Um, are they role models for you? Would you hire them? Do you like them, etc.? How well did they perform? And students, men and women, agree that both Heidi and Howard did a very good job, but we do not like Heidi. And we do not like Heidi because Heidi doesn't conform to our stereotypes of what the typical venture capitalist or typical entrepreneur looks like. She also doesn't conform to our stereotypes of what a good woman does or looks like. We sometimes call this the competence likability dilemma. And that is truly a dilemma that uh, women face, but men don't. Why? Because men can combine being assertive, being a leader, being self-confident, and being likable. So we don't think that's a contrast for men. But for women, we have that conflict where we're thinking, oh, she's very competent, very self-confident. Therefore, she cannot be particularly nice. Um, so that's the Heidi Hauer problem. And sadly enough, lots of evidence suggesting that that also applies to negotiation situations. Because that's a place, of course, where in order to succeed, you have to be somewhat more assertive and you have to be um, somewhat more self-confident and you have to be you know, somewhat more competitive or somewhat more risk-taking. Um, so I can't just you know, sign that statement, uh, just lean in more um, because in fact it is socially risky for women to do so. Now, um, I used to teach negotiation um, and game theory at Harvard and then, you know, who am I to tell my students, particularly my female students, you know, let me fix the system first, and then in 83 years, <laughs> coming back, um, and, you know, and then you're ready to negotiate. So the big question, of course, is what do we do in the interim? Uh, so let me give you kind of two thoughts. Um, one is actually very, very good news. We don't find a gender gap in negotiation performance. We also don't find that bias when women negotiate on behalf of somebody else. Why? Because as an attorney, imagine you're an attorney, or even you know, I as a professor, I can be a lioness on behalf of my doctoral students. Right? I can go right out there, negotiate with other people on their behalf, and that is very acceptable because people kind of appreciate my lionessness because it's also compatible with kind of my motherly caring for the students. Um, 
uh, you know, I'm simplifying things a little, but that's actually, in fact, what is happening. So negotiating on behalf of others, we don't find any gender differences between men and women. But again, it doesn't quite solve our problem. I don't, by the way, I'm not suggesting I have the answer. Um, so what else is helpful? Um, I mean, think about, and this, even it's a bit of a hypothetical thing that I'm mentioning here, but think about sponsoring each other. Right? Is there a way where you, I mean, said it's in quotation marks, can almost negotiate for each other? Right? Are there things where you might ask somebody else, maybe your you know, friend, maybe your manager, maybe a peer, maybe a coworker, maybe somebody else can make the ask. Um, and actually do that on behalf thing, and it's much easier. So I am happy to say I have the first company which just introduced this. So they now have two chief negotiators, a woman and a man, and whenever you want to negotiate a promotion, salary increase, whatever it might be, you don't do it yourself, but you talk to the chief negotiator, could be woman or man, and they do it on your behalf. Now, that's one way to deal with a very, very real problem. Um, if I may, I'm just go also going to add um, two stories. One is my kind of own story of how I, how I did. Um, uh, first, I failed. So I got a job offer as assistant professor uh, at Harvard in 98. And I said, thank you so much. Uh, can I kiss your feet too? Um, so I didn't negotiate the salary. I didn't do anything. Um, was then, of course, annoyed with myself later, but didn't do anything. So then I did some of the research, actually myself, uh, knew much more, and then I, was, uh, I got tenure in 2006. Um, so then I was determined to negotiate. Um, yeah, but I also knew there's really not a good answer, and I didn't have somebody else who could do this for me. So what I did, and again, it's not research, this is my own story, um, I shared the evidence with the dean at the time, and I very literally told David, David, um, you know, I mean, thank you very much. This is a very nice offer. Um, and you know what my dilemma right now is. I know that you won't like me if I ask for more. But on the other hand, you also know that I will be so annoyed if you pay me less than my male colleagues. Um, so this is the dilemma that we now have to solve. And I would like you to like me. Um, <laughs> but I also would like to have... So anyway, so you know where this is going. Um, I later actually... <laughs> I later took on his role. I actually became the academic dean at the, at the Kennedy School, and then, I, you know, th then it was my job, so then I had all salary information. So I can attest that it worked for me. Um, but I don't know how generalizable it is. Um, so one more story, and then I'll end. Um, so then, of course, I was at the other side of the table. And I uh, you know, made a number of offers, and then I made my first offer to a very senior um, female professor. So this was with tenure. So not an assistant professor, not a young woman, a very senior woman. And I kind of made a package with research money and you know, staff and um, um, fact, fact assistants, et cetera, and, and salary, of course. And she just accepted my first offer. Uh, so of course, negotiation 101 also is you don't put your best foot forward right away. Um, and as you might imagine, you know, in academia, there's not millions of dollars you negotiate over, but still, if I hadn't done anything, I would have had a gender gap. Because none of my previous, I, I had my three previous offers to men, we negotiated, of course, every time. So if, she, so if I hadn't done anything, I would have had a gender gap. So what did I do? So I talked actually to the president, um, President Faust, um, Drew Faust at Harvard. I said, you know, I, um, I know I'm representing the institution, but I have to go back. I have to go back to her, which I did. And I went back to her and said, Oh, yeah, um, I rethought this a little bit. Um, I um, kind of would like to add a bit more money to your um, uh, research account. And, you know, I mean, also kind of in terms of pay, I think we should think a bit more about kind of summer salary and other options. And anyway, so I negotiate with myself. Um, <laughs> I don't think we can necessarily expect, you know, most um, HR directors in the world to do this. Um, um, even though, uh, it's funny, so I, I actually shared this story with a newspaper, um, you know, a few weeks ago. And, you know, you should never read the comments, of course. You know, the comment section, as you know, on social media, you never do that. So, but you, we do anyway, so I read them. Um, and then, of course, people were like, oh, my God, you know, she should be fired immediately from Harvard because she didn't represent the institution's best interest. I would actually very strongly disagree with that. Uh, there's very, very strong evidence, including from Max University of Zurich, from Ernst Fehr, that um, we all are uh, homo 
reciprocants. So we're a reciprocal people. Uh, and there's a social contract that we have with our employer. And if we find out that we're underpaid, we will perform less. And again, lots of evidence suggesting that that's true. And so I think it was both the right thing, but also the smart thing to do. I think one more, um, one more story we'd like to hear from you. <laughs> oh, God. I, I, now I brag that this is all about evidence, and I'm telling stories. <laughs> it's very credible. <laughs> when talking about hiring, and you mentioned um, large orchestras in the US. I want mm. to Can you explain us more? Yes, it's lovely, because it is actually research. It's not just a story. It is, some, you know, sometimes research and stories go well together. So this is one of the examples. Um, so here's the story, and then I'll tell you the evidence. Um, so the evidence was um, published in the American Economic Review uh, in 2000 by um, Cecilia Rouse and Claudia Golding, two economists. It actually was a very important paper for me personally um, to kind of open my eyes and kind of, um, kind of signal to me that I need to write this book. So here's, here's what the story is. Uh, in the 70s, this is a true story, um, many of the major symphony orchestras in the United States uh, started to introduce curtains. So they had musicians audition behind the curtain so they couldn't see what they looked like. They couldn't see their gender, their race, their size, you know, their height, their attractiveness, whatever else it might be. And it's particularly interesting because many of the leading uh, orchestra directors, including Leonard Bernstein, went public saying that they, of course, only care about the quality of the music and they do not need the curtain because what else would they ever care about? Now, it turns out, that's where the research comes in handy. It turns out that the curtain helped increase uh, the likelihood that women would advance to future rounds by 50% and helped increase the fraction of women on the, the major orchestras in the United States from 5% in the 70s to now almost 40%. This is pretty big. Um, also, when we compare uh, the 40% with the typical fraction of women on the major symphony orchestras in Europe, for example, Berlin Philharmonic or the Vienna Philharmonic, where we still have about 13 to 15 percent women only, and we, we never had curtains. So the curtain is important for me really for two reasons. A, I think it just very strongly documents how powerful unconscious bias is, even for people who are well-intentioned, who kind of, and have the right incentives. Right? I don't think orchestra directors wanted to exclude 50% of the talent pool. That can't be quite rational. They had an incentive to have the orchestras play the best music possible. So excluding 50% of the talent pool just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but even then, it created uh, the kinds of biases that we now talk about. And then secondly, the curtain is important for me because it's both a metaphor a little bit for my book, uh, where I am very much arguing that we have to make it easier for us to get this right. And the curtain, of course, is an example of getting it right. And it's also a quite literal example because there are now an increasing number of governments and companies which, in fact, introduce blind evaluation procedures. Because most of you might have now wondered, you know, I'm not a musician. Um, what is the curtain going to mean for my life? Um, so there are, like the British government, for example, uh, when they now hire civil servants, that's about 400,000 people uh, work in the civil service in the UK, it's the biggest employer in the UK, of course, uh, they now remove your name, your address, and sometimes even where you studied to make sure that what we focus on is not influenced by our demographic characteristics. So you can do blindness, and you can, you, you can actually do it not just in orchestras, but also in real organizations. HSBC um, has followed suit, um, Deloitte UK has followed suit, the BBC. Uh, there's an increasing number of companies um, finding this quite attractive and believing that maybe they are then able to focus more on what people bring to the table than what they look like. Very nice. So um, we would like to open up to audience questions. Um, if you have one, you probably have a microphone there. Just take it. 
Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I'm curious to hear um, the three men that did negotiate with you. Um, what reasons or what evidence did they have that they deserve more than what you had offered? Um, I heard the first part. I didn't hear the last part of your question. So I, the three men, what evidence did they have to do what? To negotiate for more. Oh, what, what arguments? Oh, I see. What arguments did they raise? Um, yeah, you know, it's... Um, uh, so the typical arguments that people raise are things like, um, you know, I, I heard Stanford pays X, Harvard pays Y. So they're very competitive with Stanford. Um, uh, you know, with many other institutions as well. So having a kind of comparisons is always helpful. And by the way, this is um, kind of interesting for those of you who actually do want to go on the academic job market. Uh, this was completely new. When I was on the academic job market, this, of course, didn't exist. But when um, now an assistant professor would negotiate with me, they would send me a whole spreadsheet. And then it said, you know, Princeton, Yale, ETH, Harvard, University of Zurich, etc. And then the whole package. And then they're like highlighting, okay, Harvard is worse on teaching load, on whatever summer salary, whatever it might have been. So full transparency, um, which is, of course, I mean, a great thing. I have to say I'm a very big fan of transparency, um, also for pay equity reasons, but for many other reasons. Um, so I didn't mind that, but it's just a completely different, different story. So um, this is a long way to say um, having some information on what competitors offer is, of course, a wise bargaining strategy for men and for, for, for men and for women. And so that's a good thing. Um, and then, of course, you give reasons. Um, it's also a good bargaining strategy. Again, I would say for men and for women. And again, we kind of understand the caveat um, that we understand that women experience social backlash. Uh, but to give reasons, you know, I need a bigger research budget because I run field experiments and lab experiments cost about, you know, $20,000, but a field experiment costs $200,000 and can also be $2 million. So uh, kind of giving reasons why um, is another winning strategy that you might want to think about. Uh -huh. So uh, when I uh, negotiated with assistant professors, they typically had offers from other places, um, but not so much for um, uh, lateral hires. These were hires that were stealing from other places. Um, so they kind of have a job. So they do have an outside offer. They have a job elsewhere, and then we're stealing them from the ETH, and then we, you know, we, we bring them to Cambridge. Um, and uh, yeah, we're trying to compete with the beautif beautiful Zurich and other things. Um, but in any case, um, an outside offer, of course, is very helpful. If you have one, I mean, particularly as, you know, for example, uh, if you go on the job market for the first time, it's very, very helpful, no question. Thank you. So we have another question here. Do we have more mics or should they? Other. Thank you very much for, the, for your uh, words. It was very interesting. By the time I started my PhD studies in business informatics, I was one of 30 students, the only woman. Um, the first day it was like, um, welcome, lady and gentlemen. <laughs> By the time I finished my studies, um, I got a suggestion, you should stay in university because you will get a job for sure, because you are one woman in IT. Mm. Um, that was a reason to say, I don't want to be the one just for being a woman to, to get a job just for being a woman. You were talking about debiasing the system. I know being a role model would mean maybe I should have thought about taking this opportunity, but I don't want to. Um, so are there any statistics on the question of um, how many women would be willing to go take this role of being the one quote woman? Mm -hmm. And uh, a personal question to you. Would you do that? Mm. Yeah, no, no, it's a very good question. Um, so thankfully, I never, I never was confronted with, uh, with the question myself. Um, but I'll reflect a bit more. I mean, I'll, I'll go, come back to that at the end. But I first wanted to give you a more scientific answer. And that is, there's no question that if you are the only one, only woman, only Swiss, only man, you know, only American, whatever it might be, um, only black um, uh, person, um, you will be taken for a token. I, and most of you have been the one in a room 
and then they're like, and how do the women feel about this? And you're there because you're an engineer, and you're like, God, this is so you know, discouraging and undermining my authority. So I've definitely been in rooms like that as well. And um, so, by the way, in the US, uh, how do the Europeans feel about this? I'm like, yeah, I'm not studying Europe. I mean, I'm an economist. And you know, no, but you are from Europe. So how are Europeans feeling about this? Um, so that, that certainly has been um, a very strong experience of tokenism um, for me as well. Uh, but I, you know, I can't hide the fact uh, that it was very helpful for me uh, to be in the US uh, where there are more women in academia, um, more kind of uh, you know, female colleagues. And I, I mean, I had one uh, woman professor in my life when I studied here, um, Frau Schelbert, Heidi Schelbert. And for those of you who've also studied economics here in the University of Zurich, uh, but there just weren't many. When I left, there were 6% um, female professors um, in Switzerland. And uh, in the US, about 20%. That already made a big difference uh, uh, in terms of you know, just practical things. How long do the faculty meetings last? Um, do we have to go you know, to daycare center, pick up our kids, including fathers? But it just was helpful that there were more people who kind of dealt with that on a, on a daily basis. So absolutely, the number, roughly speaking, is actually not 20%. It's higher. It's like a third. If you, are, if you have a third of X in a group, then you're no longer token. Then we are beyond, you know, kind of your demographic characteristics. Then we can just take you seriously for the con contributions that you make. Now, you know, your, um, your bigger question was, yeah, but I was the only one. Right? So what am I going to do? I hear you. So I hear you. Uh, uh, a third would have been better, but I was the only one. Um, and, you know, I don't have a very good answer. I, I do think this is very hard. It is a very hard situation. Um, if you are the only one, and I don't blame anyone for then, you know, running and choosing an environment where the numbers are bigger. So, for example, in my classes, this is not, you know, this is like a very small example, but I'm just telling you now, um, when I don't have an even split of men and women, uh, and I create teams, I never create teams with one of a kind only. Then I prefer homogenous teams then giving someone the experience of being a token and the group of having that experience you know, of tokenism. So I'd rather have balanced teams or two thirds, one third, and then just some homogenous teams. So I think there are, you know, not in your very big question, very important question, there are solutions. Um, more, you know, there are more solutions than we think, um, kind of knowing about this, but that doesn't help you kind of specifically. And then, I mean, your question is, would, would I want it to be a quota woman, right? Just be... Um, chosen um, for my gender? It, it, is, it, it is a very interesting question. I um, Probably not. On the other hand, um, you know, the India evidence tells us that it works. But in a way, we sacrificed the first generation of women. They, in fact, didn't enjoy it. They were not re-elected. They did not want to be re-elected. They were taken as the token or as the exception. So we did sacrifice a generation of women know, for the next, the second women who came around. Okay, so there is a lot Ooh, of Oh, there's lots of questions. So I'll try to give shorter <laughs> answers. I'm giving these two. There was um, one hand in the back with the bright T-shirt. Yeah, you had it all, uh, on the whole time. So we'd like to take you. Because I am, I mean, a lot of people here, maybe they're finishing their PhDs and everything, and you want to go to keep advancing in the early stages of your career. And what happens is you would like to have as well a start a family, but the problem is sometimes is competition. Your male peers, in the case of engineers, you are one, two women, but then there are like male peers like 10. And they don't have husbands, family, and they have basically more time to work than you and to produce more. So then that's why I think like bosses tend to choose them, preferable that a young uh, like engineer that has a child. So my question is how you think we could tackle that? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it, it, is, it, it is a very good question. And um, I hope we, went, we won't end on a negative note. But again, I don't have super great news for, for you. Um, there, there sadly is you know, good evidence on a motherhood penalty 
and the fatherhood bonus, right? So fa men benefit from being fathers. They're perceived as being more stable and more reliable and more loyal and long-term kind of employees. Um, and motherhood, mothers are perceived as, oh, that's just gonna distract them. And so we, we won't get 100% of her. Uh, so here's, I'm gonna try to make this better as I speak. Um, this, the, the, bad, the good news is that it is slowly getting better. It is slowly getting better and it is much better in the Scandinavian countries. And we can actually say something about you know, parental leave policies. So as long as we, for example, only have maternity leave, that is actually not helpful to women's careers because again, it puts you in a box. But if you have parental leave and the fathers actually take it, we now have evidence that you know, Swedish fathers who have an incentive to take it and their um, uh, partners have an incentives for them to take it, um, that that also leads to longer time involvement, more time spent with the kids when they're five years old, when they're 10 years old, when they're 15 years old. Uh, so that exposure um, clearly leads to a more balanced kind of life at home. And that's um, you know, the true answer to the question and I just promise that I won't give you a long answer so I'm gonna speed, speed, speed up speaking. Um, the household still is a bit of a black box. And we won't ever have to gender equality unless we also open that black box of the household. So organizations have a huge role to play uh, in terms of how they hire, how they promote, you know, the, um, uh, daycare um, possibilities, flexible work, um, all of that, really, really important. But the household also has to play a part. Um, yeah. I think <laughs> One more. One more. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I, I want to be liked, you know? <laughs> My question is actually an advice, maybe for me, um, communication wise. Um, in a country that has a more conservative mentality, like Switzerland, for example, which is very developed, like, in a country with a more conservative mentality, women and men, I think Switzerland is more biased, men and women in a work environment than other countries that I've experienced. Uh, an environment like this, um, sorry, just keep going up. Uh, in an environment like this, where at work you do maybe excellent work, but in the following context, you are a woman, you are younger, so let's say you are uh, repetitively congratulated for excellent work, you have to do maybe two, three times better than other people to, to feel this equality. But uh, when you stand up for yourself, when you have ideas in meetings, or when you want to advance in a career, or ask for permission, like I said before, when you speak up for yourself, um, you are at a disadvantage. Like I said before, you are not like. So my question to you, because you mentioned also a little bit how you negotiated uh, at Harvard. Is in this situation, it's obvious that good communication skills um, are key to this, but which cards would you play, so to say, <laughs> in this context to, to make the other part be more open to listen to or accepting your proposal? Because the way you said it before, you were likable, you presented your point of view in a certain way, but which cards would you play? Would you, would you try to to make like a personal connection with the man or the board or, or, or the leading people in the company? Like how would you approach it to make yourself yeah. more? Yeah, thank you for an easy question at the end. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but I also, so I, I will answer your question, but I, I do want to be very um, truthful in advertisement. And that is my book is not a self-help book. My book primarily focuses on what organizations can do, not what individuals can do. And I just want to be very, very transparent about that. And I wrote the book because I don't think we can keep trying to fix women to you know, meet the requirements of the system, but we have to change the system. And that's um, why it is a hard problem, as long as we have the kind of environment that we're in. So let me give you a systematic answer first and then a more personal answer. But um, the systematic answer is, so I recently, um, uh, this is actually not in the book, but I, for some reason I was working more with law firms. 
and uh, many law firms have a gender gap in promotion to partnership, and uh, so did this one very big law firm, one of the top five in the U.S., and they asked me, so what can we do? So we did lots of things about the promotion process, tried to, you know, de-bias the promotion process, but they kept telling me, and it is related to your question, you'll see. <laughs> uh, they kept telling me, but some people just have a thin file, right? So I'm like, what do you mean with the thin file? And they're like, well, you know, they haven't been included in the cool deals. They've never done, I don't know what they've done the last eight years. I mean, they kind of have no, very little feedback, you know, nothing like of, of importance to show for. So then we went back. And then we saw that this, this starts in year one. So in year one, you join, you join as an associate. So I think this is a global firm, but headquartered in New York. <coughs> join as an, a, new, a new associate. And we found a very clear pattern that the 85% white male partners, um, there was also 15% women and about 2% people of color in the partnerships. Um, so the 85% white men chose, of course, junior people who looked like them and supported them, and it was actually worse. It was preferably somebody who studied at Yale when I studied at Yale, or who studied you know, in Chicago when I studied at Chicago. So lots of in-group bias going on, and so some people were just never given the opportunity to in fact succeed. We call this um, performance support bias. And I tell you the whole story because the company now introduced a central work allocation system where in fact a partner in the little group pays attention to who is given the cool deals and keeps track over time of who is given the cool deals and do people who are traditionally disadvantaged or aren't part of the in-group, are they getting the same kind of support? Now, here comes my answer. Um, sometimes they're more successful um, to actually bring a more systematic answer. Right? So if you can break out um, of the personal negotiation for a moment or have that discussion before you're ready to ask for that promotion or for that pay raise and just kind of maybe talk about some of the evidence that you had learned about and that you were concerned that maybe in this organization, in this company, um, maybe women weren't given the same kind of opportunities to succeed, to shine, to be promoted, um, to have the kind of pay uh, that men have, and that here are some ideas of how to fix that. That often resonates more than, you know, here I am in my Heidi role, and I want to have, you know, more things for me. Now, this is the systematic answer, and, you know, it's one way to go about this. Um, you know, on the personal front, uh, as I said before, I don't think I have a very smart answer. It is a very difficult situation. I mean, I, I can't hide that. And, I, you know, by the way, I don't think neither does uh, Sheryl Sandberg um, in Lean In. Uh, she, you know, it's not the major topic, but she does talk about our research on um, social backlash, uh, but we never talk about that. Uh, so leaning in is socially risky for people for whom leaning in is counter-stereotypical. And... Um, yes, transparency can help, can be helpful, and Cheryl will also talk, so I'm going to end on something that I really don't want to end on, but I'm going to, and you, you push me now, so, okay, so Cheryl talks about the we language, so she basically argues, and there's evidence to support this, but I'm, okay, uh, it kind of says, well, you know, if women try to be it all, and try to be assertive but feminine at the same time, they're like, you know, they look the hair thing, and, um, and they uh, talk about, you know, the, how important it is for the organization that we all are good negotiators because it's actually important for the sales department. Um, so I'm making fun a little bit of that because, I, as you can see, I'm visibly uncomfortable talking about it. Um, but yes, there is actually evidence that uh, that, that can work. Um, now, I have to end. This is not the major thesis of the book. The major thesis of the book is it shouldn't be on women's shoulders. It needs to be on the shoulders of all. And it's actually beneficial for all to hire the best musicians or the best engineers or the best computer scientists rather than the people who look the part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.